Hi, Bible students. My name is Frank Abel, and on behalf of the Christadelphians, I would like to welcome you to view this, our fourth slideshow in the video series entitled The Isaiah Scroll, Your Future Now. We have endeavored to show in previous videos that by the standards Yahweh set to determine whether a prophet was genuine, Isaiah certainly passed the test. Oh yes, the Isaiah scroll has been copied many times since, but when our modern English version of the Bible was checked against the Isaiah scroll, written at about the time of Jesus' birth, no major incongruities were found. Copying of the originals has not corrupted the modern text. What has been written in the book of Isaiah contains the critical information concerning the future. And since you can trust it, you can know your future now. Now, this is the titles of all the videos of this series. And in this fourth video, we want to comment on the response of the Christian community to the news of the discovery of the scrolls and the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. It will be needful to touch on some of the Catholic and Protestant understanding of Bible prophecy to explain their reaction. You will, without doubt, notice that my assessment of their overall response was lukewarm. And I mean that in the sense of Jesus' words to the church, or rather the ecclesia at Laodicea. Some of the groups beside Christadelphians did, however, also see it as the work of Yahweh with his people Israel, and we will review that at the end of this video. So let's get started. 600 years before Qumran, Jeremiah was told to hide a scroll in a jar. And it's helpful to note that hiding a scroll in a jar was not therefore a new idea for the people of Qumran at the time of Jesus' ministry. Even the intent of hiding a scroll for a future reference was not new. Consider what Yahweh told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 32 verses 13 and 14, some 600 years before the Roman invasion. It reads, And I charged Barak before them, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. The jar containing this scroll may still be hidden somewhere in Anathoth, where Jeremiah lived about six miles northeast of Jerusalem. It suggests that possibility, the, or the possibly the group that hid the scrolls and jars in the Dead Sea area, had the same thing in mind, not really knowing who would discover them, but certainly expecting that someone would be able to make sense of the message they contained. Now, the Christian community at Laodicea, in a spiritual sense, was lukewarm. That's where we've got this word from. And we can see that if you look at the root there on the map, you will see uh, Ephesus in the uh, bottom left, then Smyrna, then Pergamos, then Thyatira, then Sardis, then Philadelphia, and then finally Laodicea. And that's the way they were written up in the uh, first couple chapters of the book of Revelation. So Jesus' words to the Ecclesia at Laodicea give us a spiritual view of the, word, of the term lukewarm, as he stated, in that uh, third chapter, verse 16. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, there are times when we really welcome a cold drink, as well as times when we are seeking something to warm us up. Lukewarm represents a process, the process that created the conditions for something losing its original character of being hot, that is zealous, or being cool, that is being refreshing. Jesus' concern was that vital moral principles be kept sharp and not allowed to be blunted by the lack of attention. In our age and in our culture, being lukewarm is an apt description of Christian morality and its waning character throughout the world of Christendom. 
The Gentile nations lived in spiritual darkness. Well, for Bible students, that's not new information. At the time that Isaiah was living, about 700 BCE, the Jewish people were illuminated by the creator of life through their prophets. For them, it was a period of illumination, even though they didn't prosper in it. But the Gentiles who had no prophets that spoke for Yahweh, it was much worse, for they were in total darkness. As Isaiah stated in his 42nd chapter, verses 6 and 7, I, Yahweh, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house, which obviously were words spoken of Jesus. And uh, through these words spoken by Jesus, his apostles, the light of truth came to the Gentiles. With the added witness of the power of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul spread its influence throughout the Roman world. However, the Gentiles, just like the Jews, would not wake up or hearken to the truth, and so largely miss the great news of the hope of ever resurrection and the gift of eternal life. Now, there is no blindness quite like the blindness of someone who refuses to see. So the Gentiles have not prospered, even though the conditions were favorable. This is just how bad it was. This idea of without the gospel and people being without hope. Well, the message of the New Testament complemented that of Isaiah. The Apostle Paul warned the Ephesians in the second chapter, verses 11 and 12, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. The Gentiles knew nothing about the, hope, the covenants of promise, and as a result, they were living without hope and without God. But there were a few that did listen. The resurrection from the dead has always been a very um, wonderful aspect of the gospel because it is the need that people have. The greatest need is that we die. Resurrection from the dead is, is great news. Well, what was the apostle's response or the uh, apostle's response that he got at Ath Athens, a place of, of um, Gentile establishment for centuries of time, when he spoke about the resurrection. Well, his experience was a good example of what happens when a brilliant light suddenly illuminates a place where, spiritually speaking, darkness always ruled. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verses 32 and 334, we read, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Some, yeah, mocked the hope of the resurrection. Some doubted and showed their preference for darkness but a few, only a few, actually believed and were attracted to the apostles' teaching. And I think that's been the general experience of the gospel being preached throughout the Gentile world. And so when we look at Christendom at large, we might expect that the proportions are about the same as they were then. Now, lukewarmness is a sign of mental ambivalence. A number of commentators on the New Testament have made the observation that Jesus' evaluation of the seven ecclesias of Asia Minor generates not only a view of their spiritual condition at the time, but also a prophetic view of the history of Christianity. This view has some merit and would indicate that at the time before the second coming of Jesus Christ, even the true followers would be struggling to uphold its pristine qualities. Notice what Jesus says in Revelation 3, verses 14 to 16. And to the angel 
of the Ecclesia of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, we all know the repugnance that we naturally have ourselves for something that's lukewarm. But we may not have a feel for what Jesus means when he is referring to it as a spiritual condition. Words like uncommitted, faithless, disingenuous may give you a little help as to what he meant by lukewarm. But he goes on to say, and think the terms mental, well, mental ambivalence for a lukewarmness and a need for I self. Jesus' rebuke and chastening of the Ecclesia at Laodicea was a work of love, for without it, they would not have remained on the path to everlasting life. So he says in chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness be not revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now they were viewing the world improperly. Personal wealth and resources are of little importance spiritually. To be zealous meant they needed first to be more engaged in the work of understanding, and the, uh, that is the instruction of the Bible, and secondly, to be more conscious of the example they were setting for others who were following them. But if they continued to be concentrating on worldly wealth, they could not keep up spiritually. Now, it's important to remember some of the principles that were established in the Old Testament. And I think the book of Proverbs is full of them. And here's one that I really love. Buy the truth and sell it not. That's a basic Bible principle, and it comes right from the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 23. And it says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy it? Well, yeah, because something called the truth found in the Bible, and it's something that everyone needs. But it must never be sold. Well, why? Because when you sell something, you're willing to part with it. You've downgraded its value to you personally. And if it is the truth that you're downgrading in its value, you will be without a spiritual compass. And while traveling on the broad way, you will find that it really does lead to destruction. This book that was written by Dennis McCallum is a book for our age. It's the death of truth. It's a condition that is present in so many people and so many countries and so many cultures today. We need to especially pay attention to this proverb, buy the truth, don't sell it. Now, the gospel of this church was corrupted in the falling away apostasy. Yes, some people were very careless in the lifestyle they were leading, such that some may have thought they preferred darkness over light. For instead of staying with the gospel message first presented by the apostles, they corrupted it by falling away from the truth of the gospel and mixing it with old ideas of Gentile superstition. In his letter to the believers at Thessalonica, the apostle spelled it out in no uncertain terms, as is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, where he stated, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits 
as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, if the falling away comes before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be able to see this and recognize this church, this group that are falling away, as is specified here by the apostle. Christadelphians believe that the man of sin is referring to the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, not just one individual in the history of that organization, but as there is always a man at the top of that church, so the one who becomes the next Pope becomes the next individual to be rightly labeled the man of sin. We are told that the Protestant Reformation began in Wittenberg, Germany on October 31, 1517, when Martin Luther, himself a Catholic, a teacher and a monk, published a document that he called a disputation on the power of indulgences or 95 theses. Now the Roman Catholic Church considers itself a mother church. In fact, you can see it right on the buildings outside of St. Peter's Square. You can see it in the square. This picture of stained glass saying, Mater Ecclesia, Mother Church. Now there's some truth to that claim for most of the Protestant churches uphold similar teachings to the Catholic. So ex except they maybe don't recognize the Pope, what is the real difference? But I want you to know that that's not true of Christadelphians. While both Christadelphians and Catholics are considered part of the Christian community at large, we have very few teachings in common. Let's look at an example of the Roman Catholic false teaching, and in particular, the one called replacement theology. Now, here is one of the examples of differences in teaching. So we need to know the answer. What is replacement theology or supersessionism? And this is the answer we get. Replacement theology, also known as supersessionism, essentially teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. Adherents of replacement theology believe the Jews are no longer God's chosen people, and God does not have specific plans for the nation of Israel. So you can see I got it off the internet, but I can assure you that's what it means. Well, as you can see, the replacement theology is justification used by people who believe that God has rejected the Jews. That belief, however, brings us right back to the scroll of Isaiah, as we shall see in a couple of slides. But it also illustrates why getting Christian teaching is right, that is, is so important and why Christians can easily get caught up in anti-Semitic activities if they believe in replacement theology. So it's a departure from the truth. Now, I want you to see this. We have a look at Roman Catholic Catholicism. We look at the Catechism. And this will help you to see why that church supports replacement theology. They say in number 82 in the Catholic Catechism, as a result, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of Revelation is entrusted does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. Well, that statement begs the question, does Yahweh, the God of the Bible, entrust the transmission and interpretation of his, of his revelation to a group that believes tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence that God reveals to people? That's utterly nonsense. The Bible reader or writer Jude said in his book in chapter 1 verse 3 that it was diligent that he was very diligent rather to write to them of the common salvation and telling them to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints he gave this instruction long before the catholic church was even thought of 
the Bible testimony was complete, nothing needed to be added, and certainly nothing removed. Now, what are the results of replacement theology? Well, this is what the Catholic Church goes on to say. In number 762, the remote preparation for this gathering together of the people of God begins when he calls Abraham and promises that he will become the father of a great people. Its immediate preparation begins with Israel's election as the people of God. By this election, Israel is to be the sign of the future gathering of all nations. But the prophets accuse Israel of breaking the covenant and behaving like a prostitute. They announce a new and eternal covenant. Christ instituted this new covenant. Now that's a real tangle of truth and error. What suggestion is there that God ever made any difference in his promises to Abraham that his descendants would be the means by which the blessing would come upon all nations. The fact that the prophets accuse the uh, nation of breaking God's covenant does not add up to there is now another covenant in replace of it. That's uh, just the thinking of the Catholic Church. That's the thinking of the councils and the the fathers of the Catholic Church as being of equal importance. Um, that doctrine does not wash with scripture. But surprisingly, it's also believed by Jehovah's Witnesses. Now the sect called Jehovah's Witnesses do not consider themselves as daughters of the Roman Church, but they are likewise duped by replacement theology, for they assert this, to make known to the people that Jehovah is the true and almighty God. Therefore, we jo joyfully embrace and take the name which the mouth of the Lord God has named. And we desire to be known and called by the name to wit, Jehovah's Witnesses. Their desire to be called Jehovah's Witnesses doesn't mean they have replaced Israel as God's witnesses, even though they quote it right there in Isaiah 43, verse 10 to 12. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses have been duped as well as to believe in, in the replacement uh, theology. Truly, God says in that quote in Isaiah 43, to Israel, you are my witnesses. They weren't necessarily willing witnesses, but it didn't matter because even being unwilling witnesses, there were so many prophecies written of what would happen to them if they followed God's teaching and what would happen to them if they didn't, that it's all there. And all they do is fulfill it, whether they're willing or unwilling. So to see the nation of Israel as now having not having any special purpose in the sight of God and being blinded by their understanding of scripture, groups like the G JWs would not have seen anything spiritually unusual about the events that happened on November 29th, 1947. Like, what would they make of it? They didn't expect anything further of God related to Israel. So it must have just gone over their heads. Now, I'd like to just make a comment or two about the scholars. I don't consider myself a scholar. I consider myself a Bible student. God will determine whether or not any latter or really advancement into scholarship was uh, contained in my life and the life of others. But this is what people who like to call themselves scholars have to say. Now this man, Allegro, wrote this book, you can see off to the right there, The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Christian Myth. And this is what he said. He suggested that traditional Christianity developed through a literal misinterpretation of symbolic narratives found in the scrolls by writers who did not understand the minds of the Essenes. He further argued that Gnostic Christianity developed directly from the Essenes and that Jesus Christ was a fictional character based on a real person who had helped establish the Essene movement or way 
and lived in the first century BCE around 100 years before the traditional period of, of New Testament events. In a chapter entitled, Will the Real Jesus Christ Please Stand Up? Allegro referred to this man as the teacher of, right, of righteousness. Well, you may not know what is meant by the teacher of righteousness, but it certainly doesn't refer to Jesus Christ in those writings. If Allegro is a good example of Christian scholars, it is plain to see that they are not Bible scholars. Rather, they're Bible slanderers. Bible students will view Jesus Christ with the utmost reverence because he, tempted in all points like ourselves, did not sin. Which of these scholars can make that claim? As such, the God of the Bible made him our means of salvation. Teaching that Jesus Christ was a fictional character shows utter disdain for the man appointed to be the judge of all mankind. Now here is another book uh, where we see the scholars at work that ignore Yahweh and Isaiah. This book called Christian Beginnings and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is what it has to say on the cover of this book, which illustrates by a, a synopsis what this book really says. Were the first century Jews expecting a Messiah? Were other Messiahs mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Were key early Christian symbols also found in the Judaism of Qumran? Did the Jews of Jesus' day believe in salvation by works? In the Holy Spirit? How did the New Testament authors think about inspired interpretation? In the book, Christian Beginnings and the Dead Sea Scrolls, six leading scholars, John Collins, Craig Evans, Martin Abegg, Glenn Wooden, Barry Smith, and Jonathan Wilson, examine some of the major issues that the Dead Sea Scrolls have raised for our understanding of early Christianity. These cutting edge articles explore the impact of the scrolls on Christianity, delving deeper than most surveys on the Dead Sea Scrolls. But we say in response, the biblical scrolls are not to be interpreted by the people living at the time of the hiding of the scrolls in the Dead Sea area. The scroll of Isaiah should be interpreted by what Isaiah himself said and whom others authorized by Yahweh, also said about it. The wisdom of Isaiah comes from writings that predated Qumram and its civilization by seven centuries. It appears that the so-called scholars of Christianity are too focused on their own research to notice the true significance of the events of November 29th, 1947. So, we want to look at going on into, oh, why is this thing not working here? Now I want to just get back to this point that we've been talking about uh, from the, the book Jude that talks about contending earnestly for the faith, a fundamental principle for Bible students. Now, so much for the scholars, we'll leave them and their opinions, but let's go back as Bible students to see the simple Bible teaching tra transcends the research of the scholars of the day. And once again, we need to be reminded of what was written in, in this little section where Jude talked about this problem. So he said, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The wisdom of God was established long before scholars appeared, and it directs us to concentrate on what God has already revealed once for all time to serve all generations of mankind. But at the time of the writer Jude, impostors were already opposing the simple teaching of the Bible. How much more now, in this age of deception and loss of truth, must we be wary of spiritual deception? What more can we do than to concentrate on what was written in the scrolls and be exercised in mind by what our God has recorded there for the benefit 
of people of all generations. Now, I'd just like to show a little bit about what Isaiah does reveal and what could have been said by Christians if they had just looked at this prophecy. We've already established the credentials of Yahweh and the credentials of Isaiah in the video too, so I won't go back into that. But I'd like to say this, that when we look at a prophecy like Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, if all these other things that, that the prophet has said are true, then when is this going to happen? He says that the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Then again, in the words opening, uh, in the opening chapter of Luke, prophesied by Gabriel, he uh, was able to say uh, to Mary, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now you can see right away the link between Isaiah and Luke. But there's a period of what, 700 years between these two writers. And both of them are speaking about the same thing, about an event yet to come when this son, whose name is Jesus, like he's identified by Gabriel, and he will be sitting on the throne of his father, David. How could hundreds of millions of Christians that subscribe to replacement theology miss this? Doesn't it say there's something wrong with your replacement theology that Jesus will sit on the throne of his father, David? That's the kingdom of God of the Old Testament renewed in the New Testament. Jesus was to rule on the throne of David in Jerusalem. How could the Jehovah's Witnesses overlook this? The kingdom of God existing at the time of Solomon is to be reestablished that is part of the gospel, to be believed. Now, this shows you to what extent people will go to try to overthrow the, the evidence established by the Dead Sea Scrolls and the reliability of the Isaiah Scroll. And I found this just by happen chance in the year 2006, reading the Toronto Star, and I was reading the religious page, and I noticed that it had something on here about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and this was a challenge to the authenticity of the scrolls. They found little marks on the scroll, which suggested to someone's mind of a Chinese connection. You can see this in the, uh, in the, I don't think you could see that on the first page, but this will blow up, that new discoveries from Asia suggest the Dead Sea Scrolls may not be as old as we think. And the reason for that was they found little marks. Now these little marks could be seen. I saw them myself. I'm looking at the, a copy of the scroll they found. And it was hard to ascertain what they were. They, they, they looked like scroll, but someone thought maybe they are Chinese letters. And so whoever wrote this article thought, well, wouldn't that be a way to challenge the scrolls? Not liking, I suppose the connection between, you know, this making the prophet Isaiah of great standing today because his words were true and they found a scroll that old. But were they Chinese letters? That would mean that someone had to get those scrolls out of that cave, mark these little prints on them for what reason, put them back in, make it look like they were never opened up and then someone find them for what reason? That's the length people have gone to try to discredit God's word. But I think there's lovely things that can be said. If we look at Handel's Messiah that was written in the year 1742, uh, and look at the idea of the resurrection of the dead, that uh, he helped um, 
proclaim in the music that became so loved and appreciated by people who believed in this. Well, let's have a look. It's somewhat comforting to see the value of Handel's Messiah in at least keeping part of the gospel message in front of the faces of those who love music. One of the most appealing parts of it constitutes the gratifying promise of the resurrection being used in the words of 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, in the December of last year, I attended the Mennonite rendition of the Messiah in the Kitchener Memorial Auditorium. And it just thrilled my heart to just listen again to the number of times that the Bible brought up or the uh, the, the uh, Messiah brought up the idea of resurrection and over and over again, the importance of the resurrection. Now, the words obviously came from the Bible. The way they were arranged was the work of a man called Charles Jennings, and he was the one that gave that connected list of Bible passages to George Frederick Handel, and he very quickly and majestically turned it into uh, a, just a masterpiece. So most of the parts, the essential parts of the gospel were set to music that encouraged one to remember it. And what an impressive and powerful way it has been to preach the gospel. Yet people continue to miss the message it conveys. It's, it's really hard to understand why people would not connect by sitting there for a couple hours and listening to this performance and hearing the word of God being sung, beautifully sung, emphasized and over again and again and walk out of it not being impressed, not being at all further interested in, in investigation. Well, that's a good thing. And I love to go there and I hope you do as well because it really does reinforce what we believe about the gospel. Now, here's an important um, event of modern history, the American Protestants and the advent of Christian Zionism. It is um, viewed as an important moment in the history of Christian Zionism, which occurred in 1979 when the Moral Majority Organization was established. It was founded by a, American Baptist pastor, Jerry Falwell, and was made up of conservative Christian political committees who succeeded in mobilizing like-minded people to vote for conservative candidates of the Republican Party. The source of the article I am reading from is cited at the bottom of the slide. It has shown how this sizable group of Americans have been influenced by Bible teaching to recognize the divine linkage between the Jewish people and some segments of the Christian community. The article went on to say, with nearly 6 million members, the moral majority became a powerful voting bloc during the 1980s and was responsible for Ronald Reagan's victory in 1980 election. One of the moral majority's four founding principles was support for Israel and the Jewish people everywhere. Now, we need to be aware of the teachings of groups who have some similar beliefs to us. Christian Zionism has similar political or biblical views rather on Israel and Christian morals. But if you investigate further, they are very different in other fundamental areas, just as we have as a community had many debates with the Baptist church on what the Bible really teaches. But if you want to see what they have to say, you can see it on the Christian uh, broadcasting network, which is um, broadcasting every single day. So you can uh, just see their relationship to the Jewish nation at the present time. I wanted to tell you this little tale before completing our video. About 20 years ago, 
while a faculty member of Conestoga College in Kitchener, Ontario, I took advantage of an opportunity to speak to the staff members during a faculty development day. At that time, nothing appealed to my mind more than uh, in significance to this event than the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, so that's what I spoke on. At the time of the delivery, to my delight, the room was filled with interested staff. They're not forced to go there. They came by their own volition. And they were thrilled to hear of the significance of the simultaneous discovery of the scrolls and the vote in the UN to divide the Palestinian mandate. Later, I learned that this interest in that group was likely due to the college being located in the area of a large Mennonite community who were eager to hear about Bible prophecy. Good for them. But as it turned out for me, it was a one-time event, for the administration would not allow me to re a repeat performance the next year, which I believed was related to my having brought Bible teaching into my comments. And that's very true of many other areas where people try to speak about what the gospel has to say in today's world. So, Bible students, that's it for this video and why the Christian community, a Christian reaction to the discovery of the scrolls was lukewarm. The centuries of prejudice against the Jews for the rejection of Jesus Christ has made the great bulk of Christendom just as blind to the teachings of the New Testament as the Jews are to the teachings of the Old Testament. Our next video is to look at the same miracles through the same spectacles, but this time to focus on the reaction of the secular society. And we have entitled it, Nations United in Duplicity. Until then, I hope these videos will cause you to open your Bible, especially the book of Isaiah, to satisfy yourself concerning the truth that can be found there. Thank you.